ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر العمور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد so we begin my brothers and sisters first of all i apologize for my lateness And secondly, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show myself and yourself mercy and to forgive us our shortcomings and pardon us our mistakes and our errors and that he keeps us steadfast and firm ourselves and our families, our children upon the sunnah and upon salafiyyah to live upon that and to die upon that. The chapter that we will begin today insha'Allah according to the numbering with Sheikh Ahmed bin Yahya al-Najmi rahimahullah ta'ala is chapter number 29 some of you it may be chapter 28 depending on what print you have and it is the chapter bab ma ja'a fi tanjim or the chapter regarding that which has been reported concerning astrology And before I continue of course astrology is one of the banes and one of the trials of mankind in our times not only in these times but it was actually previous to these times also people are drowned in astrology even from the muslimin in our times considering it to be something playful and something that just passes the time Astrology my brothers and sisters is something that is destructive and if a person believes in it in the manner that our Sheikh Sheikh Ahmed bin Yahya Al Najmi will describe from the words of Sheikh Al Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab then it may even take a person outside the fold of Islam wali a'udhu billah and we do not spend our lives and we do not go into all of this toil and hardship so that in the end subhanallah that we leave the fold of islam and we seek refuge with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that you see the newspapers and the magazines and the internet filled with articles that direct the people towards astrology and they regard it to be something playful some people of course for them it is the mainstay of their life they don't leave the house up until they've read their stars or they have consulted an astrologer The chapter <coughs> Sheikh Al Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab he mentions he mentions that Imam Al Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala said in his Sahih that Qatada radiyallahu rahimahullah ta'ala from the tabi'in that he said khalaq Allah hadhihi an nujum lil thalath that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he created these stars for three purposes جعلها زينة للسماء that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them as a decoration or a beautification of the heavens ورجوما للشياطين and as fiery missiles to drive away the shayateen وعلامات yuhtada biha and that they are signs that the travelers they guide themselves by and then he said that whomsoever ta'awwala the whomsoever interprets the stars in other than this manner akhta'a then he has then he is mistaken and he has lost his reward 
and that he has burdened himself with that which he has no knowledge of. This hadith <coughs> reported by Bukhari in mu'allaq form, meaning, or this athar reported by Bukhari in mu'allaq form, meaning that it is disconnected. It is disconnected at its beginning. Then he mentions <coughs> that Qatada hated that the hated the studying of the lunar phases of the movement of the moon through the sky. And Ibn Uyayna, rahimahullah, he did not allow it. And this was narrated by Harb from both of them, from both of these great scholars, Qatada and Ibn Uyayna. Qatada, of course, from the Tabi'een and Ibn Uyayna from the generation after. However, he said that Imam Ahmed and Ishaq, rahimahum Allah, allowed the learning and the studying of the movement and the phases of the moon. In the footnote, Sheikh Ahmed, rahimahullah, he said that one can refer back to Tabaqatul Hanabila and also Ibn Rajab in Fadl Ilm al Salaf, as has been stated by the verifier of the explanation of, the, of Kitab al Sawheed, the famous explanation, Fatul Majid. Sheikh Al-Walid, who is the verifier of that, the muhaqqiq, Al-Walid bin Abdul Rahman, Ali Firyan. Then Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, he said, that Abu Musa, radiyallahu anhu, said that Allah's Messenger, alayhi salatu was salam, that he said that they are three. Naam. That he said, thalathatun la yadkhulun al-jannah. That they are three who will not enter into Jannah. The one who is addicted to drinking alcohol, the severer of the ties of kinship of the womb, and he mentioned the one who believes in magic, reported by Ahmed and even Hibban in his Sahih. In the footnote, Sheikh Ahmed he mentioned. It is reported in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed and he gives the reference. Hadith number 19,587 and he gives the volume also. Also Ibn Hibban in his Sahih. And Shaykh Al-Albani, rahimahullah, he declared it Sahih due to لغيره, meaning due to other supporting narrations in Sahih at targhib wa Tarheeb. In explanation, Sheikh Ahmed bin Yahya and Najmi, he mentioned that the definition of Tanjim or the definition of astrology is that astrology are those affairs which are interpreted for events occurring on earth and events of the universe. This knowledge was taken from the misguided nations that preceded the prophethood of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. People would believe that if a certain star appeared or aligned itself with the moon and if a person was to marry upon that night, then something would occur. Or if a person travelled on that night when a certain star aligned itself with the moon on that night, then if a person travelled upon that night, then something would happen. The astrologers take the name of a person. And this is what those astrologers who obviously tell the fortune of people and the future of people. They take the name of a person and they take the name of his mother and gather the letters of their names together. And in this regard, and what they do is that using that, they use the stars. In this regard, he mentioned that they have inherited the ways taken or a way taken from the people of falsehood that gather together various affairs that negate the Sharia legislation. And they are as follows, and he mentions them. So in essence, what they do is that they take the name of a person 
and they take the name of his mother, they gather them together, the letters of these names, and then they look into the stars, and then they, then they read a person's fortune. And in that, they negate the Sharia in different ways. And then he mentions, the first of them is their claim of having knowledge of the unseen. Secondly, their claim of having an effect upon the creation due to the alignment of the stars or the appearance of the stars alongside the moon. In essence, the alignment of the stars with the moon. Thirdly, their assertion that they are partners alongside Allah. This is what their activity leads them to assert, that they are partners alongside Allah, since they claim that the celestial bodies, the planets and the stars, have an effect upon the events in this cone, in this creation. And that belief of theirs is major shirk. It is major polytheism and idolatry. Fourthly, they claim that there is a connection between the stars and the minds of the people and their intellects. They believe that the stars have an effect upon the minds of the people. And this is a lie. And this is deceit of the highest order. And it is misguidance. And we ask Allah for safety from that. Then he mentioned that the science of the study of the stars is divided into two categories. Ilm tasyir which is the study in essence of the moon phases, and Ilm ta'thir the study of the influence of the stars. He said, as for Ilm tasyir then this is the study of the movement of the moon and its phases. And this is done in order to acquaint oneself with the times of cultivation of the fields and so on. There are 28 moon phases that are divided across four seasons. For each season, there are seven phases that are completed in 13 days, i.e. three months for every season. Autumn has seven phases of the moon. Winter has seven phases. Rabi or spring, it has seven phases. And the summer, it has seven phases. So each season is three months. So this is ilm tasir This is the knowledge of the moon phases in which there is no harm. Even if a few of the Salaf disapproved of it. Both Imam Ahmed and Ishaq, they permitted its use. Why? Because this, of course, allows the farmers to recognize what season they're in and how long the season is going to last. So it is something that is fixed by way of knowing when the moon will appear, appear and when it will not appear. So they know that if certain number of phases has passed by, then winter is close, or spring is close, or autumn is close, or winter is close. And of course, that is the orbit of the moon over the earth. So there is no fortune-telling or soothsaying or seeking knowledge of the unseen that is, in, is, uh, is involved in that. And that is something that is approved of, even though some of the Salaf, from them, as we mentioned, Qatada and Ibn Uyayna, they disapproved of it. But nevertheless, it is something permitted. And the point here is, my brothers, <clears throat> is that, look, the moon going around in its orbit around the earth, and the phases that it takes, that some of the Salaf, if a person look towards those phases that are fixed, not for fortune telling, not for soothsaying, not for seeking knowledge of the unseen, that some of the Salaf, they frowned upon even that, even though that is an affair that is known, only so that they may be guided 
to tell them winter is close because we've had this many months go by in autumn <clears throat> or spring is close because this many months have gone by in winter. So these are fixed affairs and the Salaf were weary, some of them. Qatada, Ibn Uyayna, that they were weary that a person should not look towards that. And this is something that is the easiest of affairs without any difficulty. And that's why Imam Ahmed and Ishaq, Imam Ahmed and Ishaq, of course, Ibn Rahaway, that they permitted looking at the phases at the manazil of the moon, of the qamar. They never had any issue with that. But just the fact that there is a discussion over the moon phases, you can see how much greater of a danger is in that, that people look into the stars, into the stars and based upon that, they try to figure out what's going to happen tomorrow or who should, they should marry and who they should not marry and when they should travel and not travel. How much greater is that evil? Even if in an affair such as, as simple as the moon phases that some of the Salaf would frown upon, then how about something even greater than that wherein people actually claim that they have knowledge of the unseen? As for ilm ta'thir, this is the belief that the stars have influence over the children of Adam. And, <coughs> and they uh, naam over the children of Adam and that they are tied to the stars and that uh, naam that the stars have an influence over the children of Adam and the stars that they are tied to their lives and to their deaths to their health and their sickness their security and their warfare their ease and their hardship their poverty and their richness all of these are tied in in the claims of these people to astrology the stars and their influence this, sh- this saying of theirs, of course, is sheer falsehood. And this belief is haram, forbidden in Islam. And whoever believes in it, leaves the fold of Islam. Meaning, whomsoever believes that the stars have an influence over the children of Adam in their lives, their deaths, their health, their sickness, their security, and their harm, their ease and their hardship and so on. Whoever believes in that, then he has left the fold of Islam. And whoever dies whilst holding this belief dies as an unbeliever deserving of eternity in hellfire. This is because the verses of Allah in the Quran clarify for us that the knowledge of the unseen is the sole right of Allah and not for anyone else. And none from the creation have an entry point into it. And astrology has no influence upon the lives of the servants of Allah. Indeed Allah alone, indeed Allah alone is the one who affects and influences and organizes the affairs of his servants. He is the one who created them. He is the one who provides sustenance for them. Their lives and their deaths are in his hand. Their health And their sickness is in his hand. Their poverty and richness is in his hand. Their happiness and their hardship and wretchedness is in his hand. Their ownership and the absence thereof is in his hand. Their honor and might and their lowliness and humility is in his hand. No one can give if he prevents and no one can prevent to whom he gives. There is no way out or path for the one who he has decreed over. Everything is in his hand, under his charge and his power. This is the correct aqidah, the correct belief, which Islam has come with. Whoever opposes it or contradicts it and believes that the stars influence the creation, and influence the lives of the people due to the reading of certain books that spread this baseless knowledge, such as the book of Abu Ma'ashar al-Balkhi, 
the Persian, the astrologer, who died in the year 886 in the common era. And that which is contained of baseless, futile information in the book, Shamsul Ma'arif, and other such books. So whoever interprets the purpose of the stars, other than what is known, is mistaken and has burdened himself and has lost his share of the hereafter. For this reason, Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, he mentioned the saying of Qatada, that Allah created these stars for three purposes, for the decoration of the heavens, for the decoration of the heavens and their beautification, and as fiery missiles against the devils, and as signs for one to navigate by. And Qatada continued that whoever interprets them to mean other than this is mistaken, loses his share of reward and burdens himself with that of which he has no knowledge. The proof that the stars are beautification of the heavens is the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَسَابِيحِ and we have certainly beautified the nearest heaven with stars. And as for the proof that they are missiles against the devils, is in the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَجَأَلْنَاهَا رَجُومًا لِشَيَاطِينَ Wherein Allah has said, the meaning of which is, and we have made from them, meaning from the stars, missiles that are thrown at the devils. Meaning those devils that try to listen, listen in to the duties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to the angels. So they try to listen in so they can get snatches of that which is to occur. So Allah has made the stars as missiles against those devils. The proof that Allah has made the stars Signs that one is guided by in the darkness on land and by sea is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Surah Al-An'am, the previous two, of course, from Surah Al-Mulk, wherein Allah has said, Huwa alladhi ja'ala lakum ad-najuma li tahtadu biha fi dhulumati al-barri wal-bahar. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, the meaning of which is, and it is He who has set the stars for you so that you may guide your course with their help through the darkness of the land and the sea. So those are the three purposes for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the stars in the sky. And then there is the hadith of Abu Musa radiallahu anhu who said that Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that they are three who will not enter into Jannah. The one addicted to drinking alcohol. The severer of the ties of kinship of the womb and a believer in magic reported by Imam Ahmed and Ibn Hibban in his Sahih. Sheikh Ahmed bin Yahya al Najmi rahimahullah said, This forbiddance is explained in two ways. Firstly, whoever permits the continual drinking and addiction to alcohol and makes that permissible, makes istihlal of that and makes permissible the breaking of the bonds of kinship, then such a person will never enter paradise. Rather, he will remain eternally in the hellfire and Allah's refuge is sought from that. So this issue, my brothers and sisters, is related to making istihlal of that which is haram, meaning that Allah has made something haram and then a person comes along and he says, no, it is halal. This one is a kafir. Even though the act, if a person was to commit it without saying it is halal, without believing it to be halal, then he would be a sinner, of course. For example, a zani, a fornicator, is a major sinner. 
and he remains a major sinner because the outward deed that he's doing upon his limbs are sinful. But in his heart, he knows that Allah has made this haram. So he is a person who has fallen into major sin. He's a fasiq or a zani. He's an open sinner or and a fornicator. However, if that fornicator was to now say, Zina is halal. If he was to say that, or if he was to believe that, then he has left the fold of Islam. So there's a difference between, as Sheikh Ibn Baz mentions, istihlal badani and istihlal qalbi. If a person apparently does something upon the limbs, that which is haram, whilst believing that what he is doing is haram, then he is a sinner, a Muslim, weak in iman. If he was to commit a sin outwardly, knowing it to be haram, but he believes in his heart, or he utters upon his tongue, that even though it is haram, said by Allah, for me it is halal, he becomes a kafir. Why? Because he has now believed in his heart because now this is related to his belief because now he believes in his heart that which Allah has made haram he can make halal he now becomes a disbeliever by way of that right so this this is what Sheikh Ahmed al Najmi here is saying as for a person who commits sins then he's a major sinner so long as he knows and he maintains that it is a sin so this is what he means, that whoever permits continual drinking and addiction to alcohol and makes that halal and makes permissible the breaking of bonds of kinship, then such a person will never enter paradise ever. Rather, he will remain eternally in the hellfire. And Allah's refuge is sought from that. He mentioned secondly, the second way it is explained this forbiddance. He said, all the meaning could be that the one addicted to alcohol and the one who cuts the ties of the womb of kinship will not enter the gardens prepared for the mu'mineen, but rather they will enter the lower gardens after they have been punished, meaning in hellfire, and purified and cleansed. So these gardens that the people, these are the gardens that the people of major sins will enter. Meaning that they will not enter the Jannat, the paradise, the gardens of paradise that have been prepared for the believers who will enter into paradise without being punished. But rather, they will enter the gardens of paradise that have been made for the sinners after they've been purified in the hellfire. He said this is another understanding that we can take from this. As for the saying, and a believer in magic. The believer in magic, as the Prophet ﷺ said, that three will not enter into Jannah, and the third of them is the believer in magic. He said, as for the believer in magic, then he is an unbeliever. And the unbeliever will enter the hellfire forever. He is a kafir. As for our interpretation of the first two sinners, in the manner that we have mentioned, then that is because addiction to alcohol is from the major sins. Its performance does not entail the disbelief that exits one from the religion. And likewise is the case of cutting of the ties of kinship of the womb. It does not entail a person exits the fold of Islam or that he is a kafir belonging in the hellfire for eternity. And as for the one who believes in magic, then he is a kafir, a disbeliever, as we have mentioned. So I hope that clarifies the difference between a sinner, meaning the one who commits outward sins, and the one who makes those sins halal. And of course, no Muslim, no Muslim in his right mind would ever say that gambling or fornication, or drinking wine, or other than that is halal. No one would say that. No Muslim would say that.
in his right mind. Only an insane one or the one who desires to exit the fold of Islam. No Muslim would say that. He would never say, Allah has made it haram, I make it halal. No one would say that. If he does, he becomes a kafir. Because he has now entered this affair into his belief. So it is not the issue of the sin itself. It is the issue of now denying. Denying and making takdeeb. And rejecting that which Allah has said. A final note here. That why did he mention magic? This is uh, something that I mentioned to you from myself. Why did the author, Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, mention, mention the issue of magic? That he will not enter into Jannah, the one who believes in magic. Why did he bring it under astrology? Anyone know? No. Why did he bring the issue of magic under the chapter of astrology? Because... The whole chapter is dealing with astrology, right? You know, the people say Sagittarius or Libra or whatever. This is the Western concept of it. That you look into the stars or some shaitan from amongst human beings. He looks into the stars for you and he says, oh, when were you born? You're born on such and such a day. What's your name? He says, you give him your name. What's your mother's name? You give your mother's name. Okay, were you born in the morning or in the evening or in the day or in the night? You give them this information then they tell you, right, you are Libra. Or you are Sagittarius. Or you are Virgo. Or that you were born when Jupiter and such and such a star, they were in line with each other. And based upon this, then you will become wealthy. You will be a wealthy man in years to come. And so on. This is, this is the way that they operate. So the whole chapter is dealing with the forbiddance of this type of astrology. But the final hadith that he brings is the hadith of Abu Musa. That there will be three who will not enter into Jannah. The one addicted to alcohol, meaning the, the alcoholic. The sever of the ties of kinship. And the shahid here being the believer in magic. What's the connection between magic and astrology? Yes, astrology falls into magic. Go back to chapter 25. This is the importance of keep revising the chapters. If you go back to chapter 25, the chapter 25 is on the types of magic. Ibn Abbas narrated that Allah's Messenger وسلم, said whoever acquires knowledge of a branch of astrology of Tanjim has certainly acquired a branch of magic whoever acquires a branch of astrology has acquired a branch of magic he increases in it as he continues acquiring it so the more astrology that a person studies and acquires the more he increases in magic that's why he has brought this in this chapter. And this hadith, by the way, reported by Abu Dawood, declared Hassan by Shaykh al-Albani in Sahih ibn Majah, hadith number 2002. Also in chapter 26, on fortune tellers and soothsayers, wherein the author, he states, from Abu Huraira, that Allah's Messenger sallallahu said, that whomsoever approaches a fortune teller or a soothsayer and believes in what he says, has surely disbelieved in what was revealed to Muhammad The hadith reported by Abu Dawood declared Sahih by Al-Albani rahimahullah in Sahih ibn Majah 566. The point here being that what is the goal of the astrologer? To tell you your future and your fortune. What's the goal of the soothsayer? Or the kuhan, the soothsayers and the fortune tellers and the arraf, the one who claims knowledge of the unseen, the diviner. What's their goal? Same as the goal of the astrologer. But they use different means and different methods to give you the same thing. So some of them sit with a crystal ball. Some of them want to read your palm. Some of them look at your tea leaves. Drink a cup of tea with loose tea leaves. They say, right, drink it. After you've drank it, they say, right, drink it all the way to the bottom. Just leave just a drop of liquid at the bottom. Then they look at the cup, they shake it around, and then they say, look, we're going to tell you what's going to happen to you in the future. Right, So each of them has their methods. Where were you born? What's your mother's name? Which star was aligned with which planet and which star was aligned with the moon at that time? But all of them fall into that same forbiddance of taking a right that belongs to Allah that only Allah has knowledge of and that is the knowledge of the unseen and only Allah can bring you good and only Allah can bring you harm and only Allah can remove it once it is upon you, not these idols, 
not the fortune tellers, not the diviners. None of these people. This is why all of them are considered as a part of magic. Because all of them use the, use the aid of devils and spells and information that you give them. Don't go to them. And do not allow your family members to go to them, not even for fun. Not even as what they say as a laugh or to amuse yourselves. Because there's no amusement in kufr. Except watching those fools do it. Alright? So when you hear what they have done, you laugh at their stupidity and foolishness. Not because you wish to be entertained. So when you hear some of the things that they do, and some of the things that the people of foolishness do, so the astrologer tells them, if you were to go out today, you're going to have a bad day. So they don't go out for three days. We laugh at the stupidity and the pathetic nature of how the people are driven, become enslaved to the creation. And then they look down and frown upon the Muslims because the Muslims, they enslave themselves to the creator. Because we realize that Allah is the one who gives life. He is the one who gives death. He is the one who gives you wealth and he is the one who gives you poverty. He is the one who brings you benefit and he is the one who brings you harm and he is the one who can remove the harm. He is the one who gives you children, boys and girls. He is the one who gives you health. He is the one who brings sickness and gives you sickness and he is the one who removes the sickness. All of this is from Allah. This is the Tawheed that the people don't want you to learn. This is the Tawheed that Ahlul Bid'ah and Ahlul Dalal and the people of misguidance and those who are astray, they say you waste your time in learning Tawheed. You waste your time in learning the Aqeedah. Look what's happening in this country and that country. That's what's important. And they neglect this affair. And the, ne and the neglect of this affair is what led them into the calamities and tribulations that they are facing. And the humiliation that is upon them. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and guide them. And to forgive us and forgive them. And, and allow this knowledge of Tawheed to be spread amongst the Muslimin. And make us conveyors of the Tawheed, Al-Khalis. This pure, correct Tawheed with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with, with, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed upon the prophets and the messengers walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in